Welcome to FACT's webinar called Pasture Biodiversity for Animal Health. Our presenter today is Kara Kroger, Sustainable Agriculture Specialist with NCAT and ATRA. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating today's session. Thank you all for being here. So just a few quick introductions before we get started with the, the main deal here. Um, Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, we are a very small nonprofit organization. We're headquartered in Illinois, but we do work across the country. Um, and we work to ensure that, that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner. Uh, we accomplish this by supporting humane farmers, such as yourselves, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and also by helping consumers make informed food choices. I have the honor and the pleasure of directing our Humane Farming Program, which works with farmers across the country. Um, and we provide a number of services, including grants, scholarships, personalized materials, a mentorship program, and of course, webinars on a variety of fascinating topics. So I invite you all to visit our website to learn all about our farmer services. At this time, I'm very, very pleased to introduce our um, fabulous presenter, Kara Kroger. Kara is a sustainable agriculture specialist with the uh, National Center for Appropriate Technology, or NCAT for short. She's based out of San Antonio, Texas. Uh, she has a background in grass-fed beef production and is currently manages NCAT Soil for Water Initiative. So Kara also wears many hats, and I know that she's a certified herbalist, a certified nutritionist, and a professional chef. So we are super duper lucky to have Kara with us today. So I think at this point, um, I am ready to turn the floor over to you, Kara, so you may begin your presentation. Take it away. All right, that sounds good. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. And thanks to Food Animal Concerns Trust for having me speak. And um, as Larissa mentioned, I'm a sustainable ag specialist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology. And uh, let's see here. Uh, we're going to talk about pasture biodiversity for animal health today. And for those of you all that are not familiar with NCAT, uh, we have been around since 1976 and we help people build resilient communities through local and sustainable solutions that reduce poverty, strengthen self-reliance and protect our natural resources. And we have two main programs that are um, in our wheelhouse. So we, we focus on sustainable ag agriculture, providing technical assistance and uh, lots of outreach and education. And we also have some energy programs that help businesses uh, decrease the amount of energy that they use and, and uh, provide economical ways in order to do that. So the branch of our organization, we are a nonprofit organization, we are not a government agency, but the branch of our organization that disseminates a lot of that information is called ATRA, and that is funded by the Farm Bill, and it started in 1987, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, overall, uh, we are headquartered in Montana, but we have about six different regional offices around the nation. So hopefully some of y'all have had the chance to work with some of our sustainable ag specialists or agronomic crop specialists and are familiar with us. Let's see here. So uh, as Larissa mentioned, I do manage the Soil for Water project at uh, NCAT as well. And that's an initiative to catch and hold more rainwater in the soil. And we're working to create a critical mass of landowners who are applying regenerative agriculture practices that improve soil health in the water cycle. And we are acting as a facilitator, a networker, and um, uh, an educational resource to an expanding web of partners interested in this mission. Let's see, I'm going to expand this. There we go. Um, so overall, the way that we do this is through regenerative agriculture research trials. We have 16 different ranches where uh, 
we are looking at how regenerative grazing practices affect the soil's ability to catch and hold water. And so we are going to be researching those uh, ranches for the next six to 10 years. And we're doing a number of different things to, to monitor there. We also uh, do a lot of educational outreach. So we have conferences and workshops and we try to make them hands-on so that people can actually learn uh, hands-on things while they're in these. Um, additionally, we have peer-to-peer -peer networking opportunities as well. And so we've recently been granted a conservation collaboration grant with the NRCS, and we're expanding this initiative into New Mexico, Colorado, and California. And we will continue to expand in Texas as well. And part of this is to the creation of the Soil for Water Network. And this network is going to be, well, it is a community of like-minded commercial livestock producers who are interested in trying regenerative agriculture practices and who are committed to monitoring changes in their soils and vegetation and are willing to share their, their results and their stories with other producers so that we can all learn from one another and improve regenerative agriculture in, in these communities. So if you're in Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, and California, and you're interested in learning more, uh, please visit the network enrollment page of the Soil for Water website, which is soilforwater.org. And uh, we hope to expand to more states down the line and open enrollment to other types of ag producers as well. But for right now, we're just starting in those four states with commercial livestock producers until we get everything sorted out a little bit. And uh, so moving on here, let's see. I'm having a little trouble with the, there we go. Okay, so I'd like to start the talk today by uh, sharing that this is gonna be an overview regarding management of biodiversity in your pastures. As you all know, this audience is uh, national. And so unfortunately, regenerative management across the nation is not a one size fits all approach. And so that said, there are some common approaches that we can adapt to our regions and that will help you create more biodiversity in your pastures and improve the health of the land and the animals that you're managing. And I'll share some of those today. Uh, but you all had so many great questions and that helped me shape my presentation and hopefully I'll be able to answer some of those. But if I do not get to them, I highly encourage you to go to the ATRA website, which I've listed here. So it's atra.incat.org. And we have hundreds of podcasts, publications and tutorials on this website. And you can type in specific topics and find all kinds of good information there. So if I don't get to your question, please visit our ATRA website. And if you, uh, you can visit it for years to come because there's so much content on there that uh, you could spend your whole life looking at it. <laughs> so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with the presentation here. All right, so this quote from Wendell Berry, there should be some profound resemblance between our treatment of our bodies and the treatment of the earth. We need to move our focus away from organs to organisms. So this is a very important quote to me, and it pretty much sums up um, the One Health Initiative. And so One Health is a collaboration, is a collaborative, uh, multi-sectoral and transdisciplinary approach that works at the local, regional, national, and global levels to achieve optimal health and well being outcomes, recognizing the interconnectedness between people, animals, plants, and their shared environments. So, by fostering biodiversity in your pastures or rangeland, you're going to become a part of this One Health movement. And it's a very exciting thing um, that is gaining momentum, and a lot of people are interested in this. So today we're lucky in that a new type of nutrition research is developing and it's called food omics and it's advanced omic analytical strategies that are allowing for the investigation of issues related to safety, traceability, quality, and bioactivity of foods that was unthinkable just a few years ago. And so while most of this research is being done in humans, it is also shedding light on animal nutrition. And these technologies have highlighted that diversity in diets improves health overall. So livestock health is enhanced when it's raised on a phytochemically rich landscape. 
So this picture on the right is a picture of what we call a food dome. And so now we can look at all the different things that people take in and create kind of a barcode of what people's um, eating patterns are. In humans, this is going to be related to, you know, socioeconomic patterns and culture and just food availability. And animals, it would be the plants that are existing in a pasture. So to put this in perspective, I want to share a few facts with you. And we all know that living tissue is extremely complex. Uh, we know that the vast majority of components in food has some kind of biological activity. Uh, in humans and both in, in humans and animals. And given that some food patterns seem to support biological systems better than others, the healthfulness or adversity of biological activity in food might be quite subtle. So we are only examining about 150 nutritional components right now in, uh, in our food composition tables. And those 150 components only represent 0.5 of the 26,625 chemical compounds documented in food. So that means that 99% of the biochemicals, sometimes also called plant secondary compounds, present in food are untracked by nutritional databases and are considered nutritional dark matter. And uh, this is important because we, um, we have a lot to learn. Oops, going to go back here for one second. Um, so basically, when we are, uh, just to explain this picture on the right, I chose this picture. I took this uh, at a seed farm up in upstate New York, and it was called Fruition Seeds. And basically, they were growing this varietal of tomatoes for a university to try to um, sell it as a high uh, phytochemically rich plant, uh, tomato. And the reason why it's dark is because it has one of those plant secondary compounds called anthocyanin in it. And it truly is what you would call uh, nutritional dark matter, right? So we know some things about it. We know anthocyanins can help prevent cancer and a number of act as antioxidants and another uh, number of other scenarios. But I loved that as an example there for uh, nutritional dark matter. So there's a lot of benefits to pasture biodiversity for livestock. And according to a study titled, Is Grass-Fed Meat and Dairy Better for Human and Environmental Health? Which was um, studied by Fred Provenza and his colleagues Kronberg and Gregorini. He states that health is enhanced when livestock forage on phytochemically rich landscapes and is reduced when livestock forage on simple mixture or monoculture pastures or consume high grain rations and feedlots. And among the many roles that they play in health, phytochemicals in herbivore diets protect meat and dairy from protein oxidation and lipid peroxidation that cause low grade inflammation implicated in heart disease and cancer in humans. And so when we provide biodiversity, we are actually able in, in our pastures, we can oftentimes increase milk, meat and egg nutrient density and production. And we can also increase the plant's ability to protect itself against pests and disease. Um, additionally, we can reduce or eliminate our need for chemical inputs because we're allowing biological systems to do the work for us instead. And we can reduce or eliminate dependence on pharmaceutical drugs. And all of those things are gonna decrease our cost of production. They're gonna decrease side effects that we see from those things. And we can also reduce concerns over residues from drugs and um, pesticides. So 85% of Americans are concerned about pesticides. And by fostering biodiversity, we can reduce our need for these chemicals and reduce the damage they cause to the cells in both animals and humans. Um, these, these pesticides and drugs cause damage to cells, which creates inflammation and has a neg negative impact on health. So uh, one of these things is glyphosate, right? Glyphosate is the chemical compound that is in Roundup that people often use as an herbicide. And we have to remember that glyphosate is a patented antibiotic and antimicrobial, and it suppresses microbial, bi uh, microbial populations in the soil and in the gut and decreases amino acid synthesis by gut microbes. And that's happening in both humans and animals. So when we're putting those things into our pastures, we're decreasing the animal's ability to build proteins because uh, they can't synthesize amino acid, they can't um, 
uh, synthesize amino acids, the gut microbes can't synthesize those amino acids as efficiently. So when you apply herbicide, you're setting back the microbial populations in your pasture. So additionally, an animal's learned ability of nutritional wisdom and self-medicating differs from confined animals to range animals. And free range livestock know how to self-medicate with nourishing bouquets of pasture herbs when they are available. And that term, nourishing bouquets, I like to, I wanna give Fred Provenza credit. A lot of the information that I'm sharing today comes from Fred Provenza, who is a PhD expert in animal nutrition and knows quite a bit about human nutrition as well. But his book, Nourishment, is uh, highly valuable in learning more about pasture bio biodiversity and how it can help your animals. So this picture on the right is the uh, ranch that I used to work on. It's Betsy Ross, grass-fed grass -fed beef. And um, basically this is a highly, highly diverse pasture. She's been working on creating the diversity in this pasture for 25 years. And you can see that there's a lot of different plant species there. And it is a multi-paddock grazing system. Um, and this is a picture of her cattle. So it is a red Donovan uh, grass-fed beef cattle. And these animals are all very healthy. They, they do not get any um, chemicals from drugs or from uh, chemical pesticides in the pastures. And they're very, very beautiful cattle. And they usually um, come up to about 1,000 to 1,200 pounds in about 18 months. So let's see here, moving on to soil microbiology and diversity. So diversity has to occur both above and below ground. And the majority of the diversity on this planet is below ground. So there's 36 trillion species on the planet that we know of um, with only 1 million of them identified. And the great majority of those, 95% of those are underground beneath our feet in the soil. And so these uh, underground microbes allow us to survive as a civilization. They allow agriculture to happen. And overall, by focusing our attention on soil microbiology, we are discovering uh, the massive agricultural, environmental, and economic impact it can have when we work with these microbes instead of against them. So just to put this into perspective, there's 10 billion viruses in a teaspoon of soil. And that's a very tiny amount of soil and a lot of viruses. So what are those doing? What are they doing? How are all these things working together? This is gonna become more and more um, understood in the coming years. And I think that we're just at the tip of the iceberg and understanding how we can use soil to benefit us as agricultural producers. Uh, the picture on the right is a up close uh, picture of parent material. So uh, uh, sand, silt and clay uh, components along with some of the microbes that we see in soils as well. So you're gonna see nematodes and, and fungal hyphae and bacteria and different things like that in that picture. So what is the function of healthy rangelands? We, this is what we wanna strive for, right? And this is also a, a healthy pasture as well. So whether you're, you're using native grasses or you are um, cultivating certain things, the things that we want to see happen in a functioning rangeland is productivity, site stability, the capture and slow release of water, nutrient cycling, and plant species diversity. And when we have this, we can produce forage for livestock and wildlife. We can maintain and protect the soil from erosion. And we can, um, in, uh, we can mitigate the uh, adverse effects from droughts and floods as well. And the basic principles of range management include balancing livestock demand with forage supply, we also want to distribute grazing pressure. So we wanna make sure that we don't just have continuous grazing and that the cattle are just sticking with in the areas that um, where you know, good grasses and, and not really going anywhere else and, and putting down the manure and the fertilization to all areas of the land. And we can do this with strategic fencing and 
water structure development and, and mineral placement that can help promote even livestock distribution. Um, additionally, we wanna protect sensitive areas, right? So if there's a riparian area, an area where a creek is coming through, uh, we wanna protect that riparian area and we don't wanna overgraze it so that it can also help mitigate uh, flood situations uh, from having devastating effects. And we want to provide effective rest periods, and we're going to discuss that a little bit more as we move on here. But basically making sure that the length and time uh, that a plant needs to recover uh, is, is taken into consideration. And that's going to be uh, uh, affected by the type of forage it is, uh, the vigor of the plant, uh, the level of utilization of that plant by the livestock, the season of the grazing, and most importantly, the soil type and the range site, right? So a soil in Texas is gonna be very, very different from a soil in Arkansas. And we have to take that into consideration, those environmental considerations. So we also wanna look at how we can manage livestock that are most suited for the forage supply and objectives that we have for our, um, for our production. So in some cases, if you're doing a grass-fed, uh, grass-fed cattle operation in Texas. Some people will use smaller cattle um, because they tend to be able to um, withstand some of the heat and uh, don't have as hard of an impact on our brittle environments that we have here. So I love this picture. This is from the Betty Ford Alpine Gardens. They did a exposition called The Secret Life of Roots. I didn't get to see it, but I certainly wish that I could have. And the picture of the roots, this is a picture of roots of a perennial pasture from the bread belt, and it reflects what a healthy below and below, below and above ground ecosystem would look like. And unfortunately, this is a far cry from what a lot of pastures look like in this country, especially here in Texas, there that have been overgrazed and reduced to nothing with chemical inputs. Um, and so in these types of systems, we see the water cycles working well and we see nutrient cycling happening well. The microbial populations are super strong because all those roots are secreting exudates that are feeding them. And then the microbes are giving nutrients back to those plants and the ecosystem is just functioning really well. Water is sequestered, carbon sequestered, and all of these things are happening in a beautiful uh, union with one another. So um, just to come back a little bit to the benefits of having indigenous pasture plants, so native pasture plants or indigenous pasture, you can call them. And overall, there's four main types, right? We've got our grasses. We have our grass-like plants, which are sedges and rushes. We have forbs, which are broadleaf kind of herbaceous plants. And then we have shrubs. So shrubs are going to be anything from like a mesquite or um, even a prickly pear. Uh, and, and shrubs can be grazed as well. And having some of those in the pasture is not a bad thing per se. Like for instance, mesquite is a nitrogen fixing plant. So while we don't want it to overtake our pastures, it's good to have it in there to fix nitrogen and help the grasses grow. But overall, these types of plants can tell us a lot of different things. So the types of herbs that we have is can be an indicator of our soil conditions, right? So if we have low succession plants, it's probably uh, telling us that our soil needs work and we need to do what we can to improve that. Um, but these indigenous pasture plants, particularly perennial grasses, are going to have deep roots that help stabilize the soil. All of these uh, forbs and, and shrubs and things like that have a lot of medicinal benefits for those medici medicinal bouquets to be consumed by the livestock. Um, these, these native indigenous plants are oftentimes nutrient dense and have really, really high forage values, which I'm gonna show you some examples here in a minute. A lot of these plants are very palatable. And I know that, you know, they there's this, idea in grazing, uh, or at least I've heard it a few times called, uh, you know, the ice cream grasses, right? They're the grasses that the cows love and they just want to go and eat as much of them as they can. And they don't necessarily go and eat these other foods. So if you give it a, a, a livestock ice cream grasses, of course, they're going to go for that. But you can manage the grazing where they will often eat these other other 
um, plants in the pasture. And many of them are very palatable and cattle actually begin to like them once, they, once their palates change a little and get used to eating in this way. So I will talk a little bit more about that as well as we move forward. But um, the, these plants are all drought resistant. And the other thing is, is that a lot of them are mining minerals from lower, deep down in the soil, and they're accumulating those minerals in their tissues. So when they die, they then lay those minerals on the top of the soil. And that's how they condition the soil. They help us to improve our soil conditions. And so when you're improving a pasture, at first you're gonna see low succession plants, but all of those low succession plants are oftentimes mining the trace minerals like molyb uh, molybdenum and cobalt and um, uh, you know, zinc and all these little things that we, we only need small amounts of, but um, those plants can bring them up from deeper in the soil and lay them down on, on, the, on the ground. Um, so, we need a good combination of these cool and warm season species for biodiversity overall. Um, so, we also need to look at how biodiversity affects the climate, and this could be a whole other presentation, so I'm just going to speak on this for a short brief slide because uh, there's lots of places you can get information. There's a book called Drawdown where I highly, I highly suggest that book um, for learning a little bit more about agriculture and how we can draw down different greenhouse gases with it. But overall, when we have an increase in atmospheric CO2, this is associated with a decreased weight gain in the growing season decreased zinc and iron in grasses and legumes, and most importantly, decreased protein content of floral pollen for pollinators, causing a decrease in pollinators. And without pollinators, we can't have all these other plants that we need to have in the pasture. So by fostering biodiversity in our pastures and practicing regenerative agriculture techniques, we can reduce CO2 in the atmosphere by sequestering carbon in the soil, and we can also consume more nutritious food when we reduce those carbon levels as well. So um, there's a lot more to this. Fred talks a lot about this in his book, Nourishment as well. And um, there's so much good information there, but I'm sure many of you on this uh, call have seen some of the studies that are coming out and regenerative, uh, regenerative studies, such as the one done at White Oak Pastures that shows how um, carbon can be sequestered with regenerative grazing and improve uh, overall CO2 uh, sequestration. So one of the things that we have to also consider is that our palate is the link, it, it, palates link health of soil and plants with animals and their biophysical environment. And so a palate attuned to a landscape enables herbivores and humans to meet the needs for nutrients and to self-medicate. And overall, uh, we have primary compounds, right? So those are going to be our, our energy, protein, fatty acids, um, vitamins and minerals. Um, and those are, there's more to nutrition than primary compounds. We have to always keep that in mind. We, we have been kind of just looking very smallly at nutrition and it's time to start expanding that and uh, broadening our horizons in that arena. So we're now moving to focus a little bit more on secondary compounds. We're, we're moving our focus away from high yields, which came at an expense to phytochemical richness and overall phytochemical richness has declined from five to 40% over the years. And um, unfortunately that that's sometimes caused by irrigation and fertilization, um, sometimes caused by picking produce when it's green and, and things of that sort. So we need to move away from these concepts and start focusing on these, on, on promoting plants that have these secondary compounds because they mediate the ecological action and they help plants defend their turf. So things like phenols and terpenes and alkaloids, uh, the tannins and that type of thing, these plants uh, secrete different kinds of enzymes and hormones and aromatic oils um, and pigments 
into the soil and also when the animals eat them. And these things can help stimulate rumen flora, which is going to help the cattle utilize more of the proteins and carbohydrates and fatty acids from the plants that it's eating. So another very interesting thing is that these primary and secondary compounds differ from day to night in plants, from day to day, season to season and place to place. So as we become better grazers, we can take these all these factors into consideration when we're planning our grazing and we can learn how to maximize the benefit to our animals and our bottom line. So this takes time, this doesn't happen overnight. It, it is a study in an art form, but it can really be beneficial uh, to that whole One Health movement. All right, so there are other benefits to indigenous herbs and, and legumes as well. And overall, this picture on the right is a picture of chicory. And chicory is a herb that grows in pastures. And as you can see, it has a very long, deep taproot. And this taproot can be very beneficial for soils that have very low organic matter because when the plant dies, this taproot senesces and, and leaves that organic matter in the soil, but it also allows aeration and subsoiling to occur. And a lot of the roots uh, from these herbs and legumes can do that. So chicory, plantain, chickweed, vetch, clover, and dandelion can all have this effect in the pasture. Additionally, chicory is one of the plants that's really good for parasite issues in small ruminants. And it is high in tannins and those tannins basically act as um, a anti-parasitic in those uh, livestock. So it's very high in protein as well. And it is a scavenging type, a scavenging type plant. So it's going to help mine minerals from below ground, which I was talking about earlier, and it will add organic matter to the soil. Um, it's not very palatable once it goes into flour, but um, a lot of livestock like to eat it, you know, up until it goes into flour. And this is just one example of the many, many herbs that benefit animals and, and the soil health all together. And so uh, another thing to take into consideration is when you have a lot of different herbs and legumes, the animals generally won't tend to eat too much of them. And so bloating and um, toxicity can decrease because they don't eat too much of any one thing. And so that's another thing to take into consideration there. But we can decrease uh, compaction in our pastures and we can also shift the populations of microbes in our soils by having more biodiversity. And in a pasture environment, we're striving to have a higher fungal to bacterial ratio. And um, when we manage our above ground biodiversity, this helps us change and manage our underground livestock. So by having continual live plant, live root in the ground and having a mixture of lots of different pasture plants, that's how we can change that um, fungal to bacterial ratio in our pastures. So this is um, a slide and this is from some of the work that Jerry Bernetti did, sorry. And Jerry Bernetti is another really amazing um, agriculturalist. Unfortunately, he's passed on, but um, this was some of the work that he did. And he's looking at all of these different um, indigenous herb, native plants, and compare, comparing them with the nutritional value of alfalfa. And when you look at them, you can see that so many of these have much higher uh, protein ratios, uh, as well as total digestible nutrients overall, than the alfalfa. And alfalfa can be a good plant, but it can also cause problems when, when it freezes and then is, is grazed. And, um, and sometimes it's hard to keep it prolific in a field, right? It has to be planted year after year or you know, every three years because it will slowly begin to degrade. But a lot of these other herbs that are listed in this uh, table will not, de will not uh, decrease over the years in which they're, they're in the pasture. Oftentimes they'll, they'll proliferate a little bit more. So that's just an example of how much nutritional value these things hold. 
And also not to mention the medicinal benefits that the plants will, I mean, that the, the animals will take from these plants too. And if you want to study some of these for your own personal health, they're very good for humans to consume as well because of their nutritional density. So getting back to soil ecology, we, we really need to manage our underground livestock with as much focus as we manage our above ground livestock. And the reason why we want to do this is because soil microbiology will create soil structure. And it's going to do this through creating aggregation. And aggregation is the little clumps. If you pull a root up out of the ground and you see those clumps that are sticking to the roots of the plant, that's called an aggregate. And these little glues uh, form around uh, the, the soil, which are produced by the microbes. And those glues create a, an ability for the soil to be penetrable. So those aggregates allow room for water and air and nutrients to flow around the roots of the plant. And so the more we can increase our soil microbiology, especially the fungal, the fungal aspects, the more we can improve our soil's ability to hold water and move nutrients and make nutrients and control disease. So some of the things that we can look for above ground in the pasture to see how above ground, I mean, how below ground um, microbiology is doing is spider webs in, in the grasses. That's an indicator of good below ground uh, soil microbiology and dung beetles. And if you pick up some soil, you see earthworms in it and things like that. Those are all very important things to look for. A lot of times in a range environment, you won't see as many uh, earthworms as you will see in a um, in a farmed environment. But nonetheless, you will see some depending on what part of the of the country you live in. Here in Texas, we don't get a lot of earthworms. They're, it's too hot and they're often way deeper in the soil than what we would usually see. So um, in general, uh, fostering good soil ecology is very, very important. One of the ways that we can do this, and I'd say the most important way and the most important thing to think about is keeping continual live plant and live root in the ground. And this is important because um, it's going to uh, store carbon, it's going to uh, feed the plant nutrients, and it's also going to uh, break down the minerals, those that mycorrhizal muscular fungi that uh, develops around continuous live plant, live root is going to keep the, the nutrients cycling. And so this is really important. And one of the five soil health principles that I, I consider one of the most important. With good soil microbiology, we also have a lot of um, plant microbe symbiosis. So rhizobium on the left-hand side is going to help fix nitrogen in the soil. And on the right-hand side, you see that arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that I was just talking about. But these are symbi symbiosis that occur between plant roots and microbes. And these things sometimes exist in the soil. Rhizobium usually exists in the soil naturally, as do mycorrhizal fungi. But if you are planting things, you can inoculate your seeds with those uh, bacteria and microbes, fungi that are specific to the plants that you're planting. I'm gonna skip that. So let's talk a little bit about holistically planned grazing. And um, I want to, uh, this, is a, this is a pretty complex subject. So I'm just gonna briefly uh, go over it. And if you want more information about holistically planned grazing, I highly recommend that you reach out to Holistic Management International or um, uh, Savory Global. But ultimately, managed grazing is a vital part of regenerative agriculture. And at the highest level of sophistication, a skilled shepherd is an ecological doctor. And he's learned to use grazing to produce meat, milk, and create environmental health. And so this is going to allow um, the health of the land to, to happen. And um, overall, we have to keep in mind that managed grazing in non-brittle environments and brittle environments vary, vary, uh, vary quite a bit. So in a non-brittle environment, 
rest doesn't have to be as long and decay is taking place and it's gonna accelerate the recovery process of a pasture. But in brittle environments, there's no moisture and uh, for many, many months, and the animals breaking down the organic matter through consumption and defecation is the substitute for that lack of decay in the pasture. And so when using livestock to improve ecosystem function, you're basically focusing on managing the time that they're there and the time that they're away. And this is very important. So um, Another aspect of this is really honing in on mob grazing or high density grazing because you get such an impact by having the herd there in, in such density that, and usually you only keep them there for, you know, in some cases it might be 30 minutes, in some cases it might be a few hours, it depends on the size of your paddock. But in order to understand all of those things, you have to know these things that are listed on this page here. So animal units, uh, usually animal units per month. You need to know your stocking rate, which is the number of animals on a pasture for a specific period of time. And it's usually expressed in animal units per month per unit area. We need to know stocking density, and that's the number of animals in a particular area at any moment in time. And it's expressed as animal units um, per unit area. And then this will, you know, stocking density can change. You can, you can play with that and get that deep impact in different ways for different environments. And so you'll need to know your stocking rate in order to figure out your stocking density. And different, different places around the nation have different stocking rates, right? So in general, in Texas, you can have about 50 animals per 1,000 acres but that's gonna be very different somewhere else. And so you can get with your NRCS agent to figure some of those stocking rates out if you don't know them. And then you can play with your stocking densities. Over time with mob grazing, a lot of times you can increase your carrying capacity. So your carrying capacity is the average number of animals that a pasture can support for a grazing season. And what people find with mob grazing and strip grazing and rotational grazing is that their carrying capacity increases over time because their forage value um, improves. Um, and so this is a, a very beneficial and can often mean that you can you can raise your uh, your stocking rates, which will improve your bottom line. So um, that's a very brief description of that. I like to recommend Pasture Map, which is a um, an app for it's a, it's a grazing software app, and it has all of these ways to calculate these things in it. And it's very very uh, beneficial, and it allows you to manage all your paddocks and all your pastures, and um, learn how to graze more effectively. You can also use a holistic Grand, uh, planned grazing chart, as you can see here. And basically, um, this is planning six months ahead, uh, planning your grazing. You start at the growing season and you plan your grazing for, uh, for that six month time period. And you expect that things are going to happen that you're going to have to adapt to. So maybe you have a flood, maybe uh, your, your uh, manager gets sick and isn't there. And so you have to change your grazing plan because uh, you've got to do it or there's not enough help or things like that. But this this is very important. Um, I'm giving a link at the end of the in the resources that is an 80 minute YouTube video of somebody walking you through how to do this. And it's very, very beneficial. And um, but ultimately what this grazing plan is doing is helping you move your animals to the right place at the right time and creating enough rest in that pasture. Rest is very, very important. And rest periods are going to differ all across the nation, whether you're in a brittle environment or not. And so um, you, it, it's, it's going to help you create that balance between forage quality and forage quantity when you give adequate rest times. Now, one of the main things to remember is not to get caught up in over planning. Um, uh, I mean, not to get caught up in execution when you're planning um, and make sure that you're always keeping planning in mind. And during the grow growing season, going to each and every one of your pastures at least one time to see what's there will help you plan for the non-growing season. 
And, um, you know, you can stockpile grasses in certain areas as well. And a grazing plan allows you to stockpile for winter grazing. A lot of people who move into this holistically planned grazing wind up feeding very little hay because they have standing hay in the pasture. They've stockpiled it in their fields um, over the growing season so that they can send their cattle out into those fields. Um, in the winter and cattle will eat that forage through the uh, snow and things of that sort. And so um, animal performance uh, is often improved with lots of different types of moves. And that's because they're not going to be exposed to the manure in the field. So ultimately they will um, be moving. They get excited about moving on to new pasture and, and, um, their health benefits from it because they're not oftentimes staying in the same area where they're then consuming any manure or other things that they're picking up. And the, the soil will then clean that up if they have good microbes before they come back. The manure, manure should disappear before they come back because the microbes are utilizing it. And um, that will help prevent uh, parasitical infections in your cattle as well. So we're getting short on time here, but we're coming to the end of the presentation. Ultimately, um, through these different regenerative practices, um, you've got the um, adaptive multi-paddock grazing, cover and pasture cropping, conservation tillage, um, biodiversity cultivation with mob grazing or crop rotation, and reduce or eliminating harmful chemicals. So these are all good regenerative practices, but the basis for all of these things lies in the five soil health principles. So you wanna keep the soil covered. You wanna increase the biodiversity through the things that we've talked about today. Minimize chemical, physical, um, and biological soil disturbance. Keep continual live plant, live root in the ground and integrate livestock as well. Um, some people are adding a sixth one, which is keeping context in, in at play and making sure that you're looking at all these things in context um, with one another and with your environment as well. So I'm going to skip this slide and go to the resources section here. So we've got our Atra publications uh, that I mentioned before. Farm as Ecosystem is a book by Jerry Brunetti, which I had referenced uh, his work, Nourishment by Fred Provenza, Natural Cattle Care by Pat Colby. She also has Natural Goat Care, Natural Sheep Care, and a number of other books. That grazing um, management video I mentioned that shows you how to fill out the um, grazing plan. And then the bionutrient meter is an interesting uh, study that's being done uh, where they're asking agriculturalists and consumers to check the nutrient density of their foods with a specific tool. So anyway, those are all good resources for you. I'm going to put my contact information up here and we can take questions. Um, sorry, I had to breeze through a lot of stuff. It's a lot of information to try to cover in a short period of time, but um, I'd be glad to answer any specific questions you might have uh, that I've covered. You're welcome to call me and I can, I can go over those things with you or point you in the right direction or send you a publication or more information on any of those things. So thank you. Thank you, Kara. Let's see here. I'm trying to see if I can get my camera to go back on. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me just give a little bit. I know that there were tons of, of um, things that were coming in through the chat bar. I guess maybe our webcams are uh, not going to happen. That's okay. Um, if you, okay. if you uh, want to scroll up and down a little bit, I'll just give folks um, uh, an update that we will be sending out a recording of this webinar along with the slides. And I'll also put links to um, those resources that were listed on that um, on the prior page um, to make it easy to find. Um, and I will be sending that out, if not today, then first thing in the morning. So <clears throat> yeah, we do have a, maybe about five minutes or so, five to eight minutes for some questions. Um, we'll see, there's some that I know got answered throughout the, or during the session. <laughs> yes, I'm just, I wasn't able to keep track of them. I had to focus on, on of what course. I was doing. 
Oh, that's so great. I, because yeah, the, author, <laughs> the author's name in the resources. So that's good. Um, let me keep going through these. Um, So one of the questions is, if only 1 million microbes have been identified, how do we, or species, how do we know there are 36 trillion? Uh, I think that they can see them, but they just haven't been able to like name them yet. And and they're they're estimating like when they do DNA reports on microbes in the gut or in um, in uh, the soil, they can see that there's that many different types of DNA strands, but they, they're not named. So they know that there's that many, but um, they're not identified, if that makes sense. Um, all right. Do you know if there are similar, similar projects to Soil for Water Initiative happening in Northeast and Southeast? So um, right now, there's not. We, we do want to get Soil for Water um, kind of moving into Arkansas. We have an ATRA, I mean, we have a NCAT office in Arkansas and Linda Coffey, who y'all might have seen uh, talk on this um, platform before, is our sustainable ag specialist, livestock specialist in Arkansas. And she's very interested in this. And, you know, we're, we're trying to move it. We've applied for a, a, a Southern SARE grant for um, moving that in there, but we have to kind of focus on our um, specific areas and, and where we get grants. So we are growing, but it's it's taking time. Um, but keep your eye out and you can sign up for our Soil for Water mailing list on our website and stay abreast of all of our, wet, our workshops and seminars. And you're welcome to come to those. Um, a, a lot of them are online. And so you can learn from us um, in that arena. Um, okay, let's see. I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling through. Sorry, this is taking some time. Um, so why do we want a higher focus on fungus to bacterial ratio in pastures? All pastures, how do we get higher ratios? So we want this because fungus has a greater capacity to hold water in the soil. So overall, um, that fungal hyphae, those networks, kind of that web that they create um, is what holds a lot of water in the soil. And, and we want that in a range environment because range environments are oftentimes, um, you know, having to use that stored water to survive and proliferate and that type of thing. So fungus is also just, it's a pH thing. Um, fungus will create a, um, a pH that's more specific for range plants to survive and bacterial dominate can also oftentimes create a little bit more of a um, of an acid environment. So we want a little bit more of an alkaline environment uh, for those plants to survive as well. And um, and then the fungi tend to create more lasting uh, benefits, right? Bacteria come and go and die and and are consumed by predators, but that fungus is kind of going to create the long standing, and we need them all, don't get me wrong, but it's gonna kind of create the long standing stability in a pasture. And the ways in which you build them is through those five soil health principles, through mob grazing, things like that. When ruminants are digesting their food, when they defecate, all of those microbes are coming out uh, from their gut, their ruminant gut, and landing in the pasture and helping those microbe uh, develop in those soils below them. I don't have any palatability scores on those plants, but that might be out there in Jerry Bernetti's work. I'm not sure. Um, Is there an ideal number of plant species recommended for biodiverse pasture? I would say that um, 30 would probably be a good amount to think about. And the reason why I say that is because that's the amount of different foods as humans were suggested to eat. If we have, if we consume at least about 30 different foods in a week, we have enough biodiversity to keep ourselves more healthy. So I'm kind of just intuitively drawing that number. Um, but I would say 30 to you know 50 plants is is a good is, is a good place. And animals will go and just take little bites of each one of those plants. They don't take a lot. They just take a little here and there. 
and um, different plants will be grazed more than others, right? Based on their structure and their canopy and things like that. But the, but plants are, I mean, animals are so smart. They'll go and they'll eat a part of a canopy off to make more light at the at the plants below. And then they'll come back to that same plant, uh, you know, an hour or so later because it's allowed more photosynthesis to occur in that plant and the sugars have, have risen. So it's really interesting when you, when you start, if you can go sit in your pasture and study what your plants are eating, um, I mean, what your cattle or livestock are eating, you can learn a lot. Um, and you have to draw some conclusions on your own sometimes, but um, it can be a, a beneficial thing. So um, is there a way to graze in this way with just two or three grazing animals? It is not a mob seemingly. Um, well, if you really, really divided up the paddocks they were in into very small areas, like with, with strip grazing, then you could do that. That can become challenging with water and things like that. But um, some people will still do that and create alleyways um, that they can get to the water regardless and they can get some impact, some more impact than, than what they would have otherwise. So you can do it, but it, it depends on your land. And, and you know, in general, they say regenerative agriculture is about 100,000 pounds per acre, 100,000 pounds of, of, of cattle per acre in order to get that really high density regenerative effect. Should I keep going, Larissa? Um, maybe we can take maybe two more. I know there was, um, let's see, a couple down here that might be easy. Someone was asking about the pasture map app. Is it open source? Is it commercial or free? Do you have similar alternatives that they could maybe access or know of? Um, it is, um, it's, it's not open source. It is something you have to pay for, but if you are a member, if you're, if you join the soil for water program, um, I think they're getting it for, I think they're allowing people to, uh, utilize it for $99 a year, which is really, really inexpensive for what you get out of it. Um, you know, I know that a hundred dollars can seem like a lot of money, but the amount of time that you can save from that can be way more uh, worth than a hundred dollars. So um, you can contact me and I can help you with that. If you want to learn, if, if you want me to put you in touch with somebody at pasture map and um, have that soil for water connection along with it. Sounds good. And those um, are as well. Excellent. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe one more question. I'm scrolling down a bunch. Um, I know there's a couple people asking about seed sources that came up and if there was, let's see, um, yeah, foraging seed supply scale. Um, do you have any insight on that? Well, only in Texas. Um, yeah. You know, here in Texas, there's um, a company that we work with some uh, called Native American Seed Company. And so those are gonna be mixes that that could be used kind of in the more semi-arid Southwest. I mean, he has a lot of different mixes, but um, so Native American Seed, he's a little bit more focused on landscape. And so some of it's a little expensive for agriculture uh, projects, but he, his name is Bill Neiman, and he may know of other people doing similar things to him around the country. So you could reach out to Native American Seed Company and ask them if they know other people doing that in your region. Um, otherwise, there's a lot of, of, of companies that are, um, that are, uh, you just have to find cover crop companies in your regions, right? So, you might be able to call like your NRCS office and ask them, you know, who do y'all utilize for cover crop mixtures and things like that. They should be able to tell you some of those things. Some of them may have these, these weeds and stuff in them and some of them may not. So um, you got to do a little research, but you can also go into pastures where you see those plants growing. And when they go to seed, you can collect some of those seed and spread them. Right. So you can do that in areas on your, ranch where you see them growing, collect those seeds and then take them to other areas and see if they will um, propagate in that way too. Excellent. Good advice. 
Yeah, it does feel like we are just about out of time. My slide is not, okay, it forwarded. Um, and I just wanted to have a couple of, of closing housekeeping items before we sign off. Um, friendly reminder the, to folks that are still on the line, uh, immediately following this webinar, there will be that short survey that pops up on your screen if you would take it. Uh, a, a minute or a moment to um, tell us about our experience, we would greatly appreciate it. Also, recording of this webinar and the slides will be available very soon. Um, these doc documents will be do um, archived on our website um, and Facebook page, or excuse me, uh, YouTube page, and I will also email them out to everyone that registered for this webinar. Um, a quick plug for some of the other webinars we have coming up this winter. Next week, we'll have NCAT's uh, Linda Coffey, who you might have seen um, on the chat bar. She's given some great information. She's going to be with us to discuss some grazing tips to avoid trouble. So I hope you can make it to that one as well. And I will send links to the registration in my follow-up email. <clears throat> so on that note, I am afraid that is all the time we have this afternoon. I'd like to give a sincere thank you to you, Kara. Thank you so much for being with us today and sharing all this really fantastic information, kind of um, synthesizing it for us um, in a practical, practical way. It's really been an honor and a pleasure to have you on. Um, and mm -hmm. also, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. maybe we'll do some follow-up follow -up sessions later. Um, I should also say that folks that are um, looking into Fred Prevention's work, I'm hoping to have him on a future FACT webinar as well. And thank you to all the audience members for your attention and for your interest in this topic and all the good work you're doing with your animals and for the land. Um, I'm really glad that you made the time to be with us. And I hope that we're all able to connect again soon. So enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your, your week and goodbye for now. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.